Well, let's go ahead and get started. Sue, um, if as, I, as I'm speaking through, if you can manage to make sure as people are coming on into the waiting room that we could admit them if I, if I miss anybody uh, waiting there. Um, but otherwise, uh, thank you all for um, joining in this for this this lunch session. My name is Alex Dupi. I'm with with MIG. Uh, we're the consultant team that's leading this this project to assist um, uh, Matt Edmonds and Jordan and Karen uh, with um, looking at the State Street uh, corridor and in ways to actually kind of think about how we, you know, kind of leverage a lot of the work that's happened in the past, which we're going to step through today, but also I think specifically today to really be able to gather input on what you think are the most important elements uh, within the State Street Corridor Framework Plan. Um, before I do introductions uh, or let, let people do introductions, I just want to give you um, kind of a sense of what the best way to do a Zoom meeting of this size if you haven't done one of these before. Um, there are a lot of people um, uh, on the call right now, we have about 30 or so, um, which I expect we'll have more come in, join in as we step through it. Um, we want to make sure that there is room for everybody to speak if you want to speak um, during this meeting, and we're doing that in a variety of ways. Um, the first element is that I've gone ahead and muted everybody um, in the beginning, just because you know there's there's wrestling in the background, there's kids, there's dogs, there's cats. You know, kind of we're in our kind of private spaces and there's a lot of things going on around us and we want to make sure that everybody has access but also that everybody can see and hear the presentation. As you have questions, um, there's a couple ways that you can provide input. Um, the first is to use the chat. So if you look at the bottom of um, your Zoom controls, there should be a chat feature. Um, that just says chat with a little box. Um, and Sue Garner, who's with MIG, is going to be managing that chat. And she just posted, so everybody welcome. Um, she'll be managing that chat to check on comments to make sure that as the conversation and the presentation is going forward, what you post in the chat, we can bring into, into the, the discussion. So that's one way to make sure that you know your voice is heard through that chat. So if you're if you want to just type stuff down, things that you hear in the presentation, or you have a question as, as stuff comes up, feel free to use that chat. Um, the chat is self-regulated, so please be respectful of others on on the the call as well too. Um, let's keep it positive. Um, if there are questions about urban renewal or about projects, it's certainly um, okay to have questions about, you know, where these projects came for came from or where we're going forward with those. Um, but let's, you know, we keep, we'll keep it positive for everybody um, here. So feel free to use that. The other way to provide input is in the bottom, there are a series of icons and it says reactions. And so if you click in reactions, it's either up, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down, smiley face. There's also a raise hand. And so if you want to speak, um, when you click that raise hand, that goes to the top of our screen so that we can see that you've raised your hand and then we can bring you into the conversation. We want to make sure if you want to speak or you have a question of the team or of others, um, that's a great way to do that. Kind of how we think about this as, you know, with an open house that you typically go to in person, there's going to be people who have knowledge about various projects and that you would have a conversation with them. That's very much how the, the raise hand function works. So if you want to speak or you have a question that you want to talk, um, just raise your hand and let us know. And again, so the raise hand, the reactions, or the or the chat. Um, so with that, I admit a few more people, other people coming in. Um, with that, I just want to thank you for the time. Uh, we're going to spend about an hour or so. Um, we have a little extra time if we need to go over that. Uh, but just to step through the project and, and to get your input. And so we, we appreciate the time that you're spending with us today. Um, so with that, um, Matt, do you want to introduce yourself? And then Jordan and Karen, and then Sue, I'll have you introduce yourself after that. Sure, I'm Matt Edmond, uh, CCDC Director of Parking and Mobility and uh, CCDC Project Manager for this project. Thanks for taking time out of your uh, noon hour today. Mm -hmm. Hello, my name is Jordan Neerdals. I am the communications manager here at CCDC. And um, yeah, and so thanks a lot, but really appreciate uh, the big turnout during your lunchtime. Thank you. And Sue, or excuse me, Karen, sorry. You bet. I'm Karen Gallagher, transportation planner with the city of Boise and uh, glad to be part of the team and moving State Street forward. Great, thank you, Karen. 
Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Sue Garner, and I'm a planner with MIG. Um, and thanks for having me here. Yeah, thank you. So we have a we have a brief presentation, and as um, myself and, and Matt will step through this. Um, if you, as I said, if you have questions or comments, feel free to raise your hand. Um, we don't need to step through the whole presentation and then have have Q and A. We can stop and we can talk about things as they come up. So don't don't feel like you have to wait till the end to raise your hand or drop things in the chat. So this is really um, you know a forum for for you to talk to us to understand what the projects are, but also as a project team for us to be able to you know take great input and make sure that you know we're we're hearing and understanding where you're coming from as well too. So just think about this as an open forum as we step through. And this is great. We have 36 people so far. What a great turnout for lunch. All right. So with that, let's let's step through. Um, let's start this. So we're going to be talking about a few kind of key issues um, during today's call. And I think you know the biggest one, and probably a question for a lot of folks on the call, is why are we focusing on State Street? You know, this is you know what we're talking about is approximately a six-mile-long corridor, essentially from 27th all the way out to Horseshoe Bend. And so, what are the key reasons why we're actually looking at this corridor now, and, and why does it make sense um, to consider this? Um, there's going to be some you know, broad discussion about why we use urban renewal um, uh, you know, for projects or corridors like this. And so Matt's going to cover that. But then also, and hopefully some of you were able to take the last two surveys um, that we had throughout the, you know, um, to help identify some of the projects and the priorities. Uh, we want to be able to show you what, what the Boise community told us about, you know, the specific uh, improvement and improvements and recommendations uh, for the corridor. And they get into specifics about what are the types of projects that we're actually um, talking about. And then finally, what are the next steps? We're coming towards the end of this project uh, where you know, as we get into the next few months, hopefully getting into draft and final plan and then adoption. Um, and so your input is really important right now because we have a draft list of projects that we've been prioritizing and we wanna make sure we get those right. And so that's why we're here today is to be able to vet those with you. So lots, lots to cover. So, before we get into it, I want to just step back and talk about, you know, kind of how we got to where we are today. Um, State Street, you know, has not been, has been a corridor that's been evaluated a lot over the course of time. And our project actually started back in 2018 when we looked at the corridor, you know, as a, as a whole to see, you know, how we would actually start to fund the improvements that the community and agencies and others have told us are important for this, for this corridor. So we, we did a variety of studies about three years ago that started to actually look at kind of the status of the corridor and how we might actually fund some projects. Um, as we stepped into this project, which is the framework plan, we used the prior work to develop some more baseline analysis. We looked at market studies, financial feasibility, other components to start to assess, you know, what might be the, the possibilities within the corridor. And then we came back and actually in late 2020 um, did our first survey. So that was an online survey. Um, we're in COVID still, we're still in an online environment. Um, hopefully starting to move out of that. But we did an online survey that asked about vision and goals and then what key priorities um, people along the corridor, you know, felt really are important to move, move the corridor further ahead. Um, we followed that up with another survey and neighborhood meetings uh, to talk specifically with adjacent residents and businesses about, you know, kind of what um, their visions are for the corridor, but also considerations um, that should be a part of the plan. And then we talked to um, agencies as well, um, Ada County Highway District, Idaho Transportation District, the school district, Valley Regional Transit. A number of those, those coordination points are, are all the key elements that went into um, the draft priorities and project lists that, we, that we're developing as a part of the framework plan that we'll talk about in just a moment. Um, with the other pieces, you know, we're coming into, you know, kind of, we have this big list of projects. How do we actually pay for those? You know, how do we structure those over the next many years uh, to achieve that vision, but to also make sure that it's financially feasible? What are the partnerships that are needed um, to make those things happen? And so that's where we're at now today to actually start talking about that as a part of the draft plan and the frameworks. And then as we step into July and August and the 
first couple months of the fall, actually wrapping up the plan and hopefully having it adopted uh, in October of 2021. I lost my mouse. All right, there we go. So the question is why State Street? And so I'm gonna turn it over to Matt um, to start talking about that. And then also we are going to do something kind of fun. So Matt, while you're kicking it off, I will kick off the poll. Oh, you're on mute. Uh, so yeah, I'll get into to why State Street, but um, before uh, we get too far into that, um, Alex does have a poll for you about how you use State Street. All right, so I'm gonna launch, if you've never done polling in Zoom, it's super easy. Uh, this is a, a poll where you can click and we'll, we'll go for about a minute. We have, we have a number of folks on, you know, on the call. If you don't wanna do the poll, that's okay. Um, we'll stop it after about a minute. If you do want to do it, this helps us kind of, you know, get more information to understand where you're coming from and the specific experiences you have. And we'll have a few throughout this, this presentation, but we thought it would be good just to um, launch this one first. So I'm going to go ahead and launch it and then we'll share the results at the end. Can everybody see that? All right. So which of these best describe how you use State Street? And you can answer these as many you can answer as many of these as you want or provide responses to many of these as you want. People are moving through. We've got quick, quick fingers on this one. All right, we have just a few more. All right, we're going to go about another 10 seconds or so. All right, I'm going to close the polling. All right, I'm going to share the results. All right, can everybody see that? All right, so we have within the audience, um, most people drive through this area, which to be honest, that's how most people get through the corridor. So that's that's not surprising, but definitely an experience that you you have as a part of that. Uh, but also um, a number of people in the audience actually live near State Street. And so that's another, you know, kind of key con, um, kind of input is what do you experience as a bicyclist, as a pedestrian, you know, living near a major corridor? What are those types of things? And when we get into projects, you know, Maybe think about that within context of, you know, are there ways or there are there projects that actually can make your travel environment um, better? And so the, the reason why we do these polls is just to get a sense of where people are, are going or where they're coming from. Um, we have folks who take the bus, which is great. Um, we actually have about 30% of the people who walk or ride um, on the corridor. And so I'm curious, and maybe the chat is a good place to do this, Tell us what your experience is walking or riding your bike on the corridor. So maybe drop that in the chat if you want, and then we can bring that in and talk about that as we get into projects. All right, so with that, I'm gonna stop that. And then Matt, give it back to you. Thanks, Alex. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and you wanna go to the next slide? Oh yeah, thank you. So we have a question mark. So uh, State Street, it's the only regional corridor um, north of the Boise River between downtown Boise and parts west. Um, and going back to, you know, around about statehood in the, the days of the old interurban uh, railway, saw a lot of development along it. Um, and as such, it, it can't really be feasibly widened um, to accommodate an all car rush hour as the valley continues to grow. So. Back in the, in the early aughts, a um, number of public agencies, um, land use, transportation, and planning agencies in the Valley started looking at State Street, trying to figure out wh what could be done there. Um, and really the consensus was to try to push um, some of that travel demand um, to other mode shares, uh, primarily transit. Um, so, and Alex, can you be next slide, please? So here's what the study area looks like. Um, we worked with the city on this back in 2018 to develop the boundaries, basically goes from 27th Street out to Horseshoe Bend. 
Um, it's 575 acres, give or take. Uh, that does include all the rights of way there. It's completely within the city limits um, because uh, urban renewal per state law, it's, it's the simplest way to do it is to keep it within city limits. But um, we do want to help implement uh, this vision for State Street as a, uh, a transit oriented corridor um, to the greatest extent within, within the city. Uh, so next slide, Alex. Uh, and so why State Street? Really, you can, you can see some documents here, the State Street Traffic and uh, Transit, Transit and Traffic Operational Plan done back in 2011, as well as Blueprint Boise, uh, which is the comprehensive plan for the city of Boise. Um, the State Street Corridor TOD plan uh, done a couple of years ago and adopted into Blueprint Boise by reference back in 2020, uh, as well as the Transportation Action Plan, which identifies State Street as one of three uh, corridors to have a first-in-class transit. So really where the purpose of this is to help implement these plans, to make the corridor more walkable, to improve the infrastructure along the corridor, um, to really increase the housing supply and diversify development types. Um, and one of the things we heard a lot um, in the last few months was the need for affordable housing, uh, mixed-income housing. Uh, foster that transit-oriented development um, that's oriented to, supportive of, and supported by uh, improved transit along the corridor. And then again, uh, implement these previous planning efforts. Matt, there was a question yeah. within, the, within the chat. Um, what about the south side of the corridor that's within Garden City? Is there any coordination being done? Um, that's, that's a great question. So uh, this plan, uh, the State Street Corridor building connections, you see it's on the, um, uh-oh. No, oh, oh, back, is that okay or no? Oh yeah, sure. So uh, that's, you can see Garden City. We did have discussions with, um, with Garden City, their mayor uh, and their um, urban renewal board chair back when we were first looking at this process because um, it is possible uh, to do an urban renewal district that spans multiple jurisdictions. Um, it, is a, it is a little bit more cumbersome though. Um, and we asked them if it's something they were, would be interested in while they you know, definitely are interested in, in improving the corridor um, as a transit oriented corridor. Uh, they did decide to take a pass on doing a joint district. So we moved forward with something that's completely within the city limits. Um, so yeah, bad news, about half of the south side is outside of the study or outside of the potential urban renewal district. Good news is the full right of way width um, is, within this, is within Boise city limits out to Horseshoe Bend. So, so some we of the- can do improvements on both sides. Great, thank you, Matt. And, and just for reference to some of the other planning, while the, the um, urban renewal study area is within the Boise city limits, uh, projects like the State Street Transit Oriented Development Implementation Plan, um, the, the TTOP, which is the Transit and Traffic Operations Plan, those are multi-jurisdictional. And so those do identify improvements or projects, you know, not just within Boise, but with others. This is the, what we're talking about today is really how we fund that within, within the city of Boise. And as men Matt mentioned, within the rights of way um, along State Street. Um, there's a, a couple other just kind of comments and the chat is great. Thank you so much for bringing those in. Um, a lot of comments about just how hard it is if you're a bicyclist or a pedestrian along State Street for a variety of reasons. Um, I think when you see some of the projects, we'll start to talk about that because that was that's something we've been talking about for a long time. So thank you for um, making sure that's in the chat so we can capture that. Um, there is, um, well, there's a number of issues within this area, but lots for, for bikes and peds. Um, one other question, uh, let's see, Matt, I think this is for you before we go to the next slide. Um, could you clarify what first in class designation means? Uh, sure, I'll take a stab at it. Karen may wanna correct me on this. So uh, we're looking at transit that's got, that it's direct, it's got um, minimal number of stops, it's got frequent headways, and that means how long between the time the buses come. Uh, and it should be frequent enough that you don't, you're not even really consulting a schedule, that you know when you go out there, there will be a bus within, I don't know, 15 minutes tops. Uh, so kind of that's it. Um, that's generally it, that there's really people who have an option um, 
to take transit rather than absolute need may elect to do it. Um, and there could be some other things like off board fare payment, uh, real time information uh, at the stations. Uh, Karen, is there anything else you might want to add there? And just longer hours of operations, um, more days of the week for operations, and then yeah, upgraded amenities at the stops. Um, and then one one other question, I think Matt, this is relevant to some of the project lists. Um, there was a question about why it's not feasible to widen State Street, and I know that there's been that's been a decision that was made as a part of the T-top plan a while back. There was a fair bit of analysis with that, but I think that that's a question for many probably. So that, yeah, there's some caveats there. It's not feasible to widen it um, to an acceptable level of service as, um, as dictated by, by ACHD for, for the you know, PM peak rush hour um, with a, um, a conventional mode share that's you know, 85, 90% of people single occupant vehicles. Uh, you know, there, we, we are planning, um, to widen State Street out to seven lanes where that sixth and seventh lane are like special use where it's transit and you know maybe business access. I know HOV isn't legally allowable there right now, um, but an interagency uh, team is looking at what that sixth and seventh lane could, you, could look like, but it wouldn't be just a conventional, you know, all comers uh, pair of lanes. Um, without, increased mode share by transit and to a lesser extent things like uh, biking and carpooling state street you know may have to be nine lanes or or more so that's that's what i mean about feasibly widening it once you're getting to that point you're talking about significant takes um the wider you make a street the less efficient each individual lane on it is so uh, that's what i mean about um feasible with with a 90 percent single occupant mode share Great, thank you, Matt. So there is there is widening, but it, it accommodates transit and other modes to make the corridor more efficient um, with, within that space, widening to seven lanes. All right, so let's um let's let's move ahead. So Matt, this back to you. Yeah. So um, S. B. Friedman uh, did a market analysis along State Street to determine over the over the twenty year lifespan. Uh, of a district with that urban renewal assistance there, um, what kind of demand will we see? And so within the, that 575 acre study area, uh, they project 1,100 single family residential units. Those are generally away from the transit nodes. Uh, 2,600 multifamily attached and those generally closer to the transit nodes, as well as about 362,000 square feet of retail, 50,000 square feet of office. Um, a modest size of hotel, hotel and no industrial. And again, that's over a 20 year span. Right. So that's it, next. And so here we see Collister, uh, the Collister Shopping Center from the South and to kind of give you an idea of what, um, what the aspiration for, for this uh, TOD district would be. We've got a rendering sort of at 20 years. And um, just real quick, this is aspirational. Um, obviously it's subject to the market, um, landowner and developer prerogatives, uh, subject to approval by the regulatory authorities. Um, but we do expect to see info opportunities at these older commercial sites like Collister. Uh, and some things I would point out, buildings fronting the street, uh, vertical mixed use with active ground floor uses, um, shared parking behind the buildings to um, really optimize the efficiency of that, that parking utilization, potentially structured parking where it's feasible, um, but structured parking is very expensive. Uh, pedestrian oriented uh, minor streets, either perpendicular to or parallel to State Street, you can kind of see them in the back there. Um, land along State Street, landscape buffers, possibly medians, um, if we can work with the highway district and ITD to accomplish some access management there. Um, with street trees and consolidated access. Um, Multi-use pathways, and this was um, a, a policy move ACHD's recently moved to go away from in-street bike lanes and multi-use pathways. Um, but places like Collister where you've already got the in-street bike lanes, you can see some transition between the two until such time as a full retrofit to those um, curb separated pathways um, is feasible. Um, 
And I think about that about covers my major points, Alex. Did I miss anything? No, I think that I think that's accurate. And I think with this cross section too, you can see, you know, State Street is widened out to the seven lanes, but those pink lanes are those special use lanes, which would be transit or business access. Um, and then there was a, a question from um, in the chat about why not islands to help uh, ped and bikes get across. Uh, you know, that would certainly be part of a broader corridor strategy. And so, you know, this one, for example, shows shows a, a planted median, but depending on location, you know, there could be um, refuges for pedestrian crossings as well too. It kind of just depends on what's happening within that that section. Yeah, uh, I guess one other thing I would point out with the multi-use pathways. So if you look at the old um, uh, traffic, I can always get this mixed up, transit and traffic operational plan. Uh, it's got the bike lane and the butt, you know, the bus coming in and the bus has to cross the bike lane to get across it with the pathways that basically takes that bike traffic and puts it behind the, you can see it in the lower right hand uh, of the image here that it puts that bike traffic out of conflict with the bus lane and the bus stop, so. Exactly. Um, and so there, there was a question from, uh, from John, is CCDC working with ITD and ACHD to streamline the process for design improvements? Um, you know, his comment was it was a struggle to get, you know, get sidewalks, access points and side streets as a part of that. And um, Matt, I know, you know, ITD and ACHD are partners, you know, mm -hmm. um, agent, you know, agency partners on this. So as development happens, they would certainly be coordinating um, to be able to achieve that. And that's partly why, you know, like the, the transit oriented development implementation plan, the TTOP and others, uh, those are those documents that, that need to start coming together to be able to provide some of the improvements that we're talking about today. Um, yes, from Gary, uh, it does go, bike lanes would go behind sidewalk, uh, on sidewalk and the bus stop in a multi-use path. And so those are generally 10 to 12 feet wide. Um, and that actually reduces conflict between pedestrians um, and transit users to get on the bus, um, but also provides a safer environment for cyclists as well too through the corridor. All right, let's move on. So let's talk about um, the role of urban renewal. So as we step into this, we're gonna keep it with Matt, um, but I'm gonna launch another poll just to get a sense. All right, so you can pick one of these. So how familiar are you with urban renewal? Um, some of you, have you managed a district before? <laughs> you, may, uh, you may be more familiar with than others. Um, you've never heard of it or you've sort of heard of it, but you don't know how it works. Matt, it looks like a few folks may be looking for your job here pretty soon. <laughs> All right, just another uh, 10 seconds or so. All right, I'm gonna close it down. All right, so let's see where, where people are at. I'm gonna share the results. All right. so. There's a few folks, actually more than I expected, who, who know a lot about urban renewal, um, which is great. Uh, you know, th we hope that this, um, this will be informative, what we're going to talk about. But, you know, kind of not surprising is that, yeah, I've heard of urban renewal, but I'm just not sure how it works and how it would work within the context of the corridor. And so we're going to step through that to, to you know, kind of bring you up to speed. Um, as you, if you do have questions, um, again, raise your hand, drop it in the chat, and we can, we can talk about that as we step through. All right. All right, Matt, back to you. So uh, yeah, at the end of the day, urban renewal, it's, it's really a tool. Uh, it's for economic development. It's a funding mechanism, uh, also known as tax increment financing, um, to invest in public infrastructure and help catalyze private development and investment. Um, and really uh, to raise revenue, finance economic growth and development. So it's not, um, it's not regulatory on either the transportation or the transit or the land uses there, but, but more to help finance um, 
the public improvements um, that foster that private development. All right. Next slide. Uh, so I like to say this in a nutshell. Um, it helps deliver development outcomes with significant public benefit um, that the private market would not otherwise uh, deliver on its own. So um, I feel like there's, there's public um, benefit to it. Next slide. So role of CCDC. So um, CCDC, Capital City Development Corporation. Uh, we are the urban renewal agency for the city of Boise. Um, as authorized by Idaho law. Um, and again, we have no regulatory authority. We can't, we don't, won't dictate how State Street is configured. That's, that's the purview of uh, the highway district east of Glenwood and Idaho Transportation Department west of Glenwood. The land uses are up to the, up to the city. Um, but we seek to catalyze investment through our own projects, um, through our partnerships with those public agencies uh, as well as through developers um, and public par private partnerships. Um, we work hand in hand with neighbors, local partner organizations, developers to redevelop underutilized properties and improve public places. Um, and real quick, I'll cover how we're financed, how that and how that tax increment financing works. Next slide. So, Here's a quick schematic of tax increment financing, how it works. Um, your assessed value is your y-axis, your time is your x-axis here. Um, if a new State Street Urban Renewal District uh, is formed, the county assessor will set that current value for each property um, within the district, uh, and that's known as the base value. And over time, as public and private investments incur in the district, um, the increase in value over base is called the increment. Uh, taxes generated by that incremental value um, set by the levy rates of the underlying taxing districts. Um, those accrue to CCDC to pay for public improvements and other revitalization efforts. So uh, we're not a taxing district. Basically, it's the levy rates coming from the taxing districts. Um, and there is some of that increment value that's expected from appreciation. We expect a lot more from development that that we don't think would otherwise occur uh, in the absence of urban renewal. Um, and with that, if there's no questions. I think I'll hand it off to Alex here. Sure, thank, uh, thank, thanks, Matt. Um, so uh, Denise, you had a comment about uh, that concept design. Yeah, let's, let's come back to that. Um, and see, so maybe you can remind me after we get through the projects, we can come back to some of that, that concept for Collister. Uh, but that's a, that's a good question. Um, so let's let's move on to the next pieces. So I want to just just to you know kind of summarize. You know we've we've done a, a fair bit of public engagement throughout this project. You know uh, again we've Matt's been able to meet in person with some of the neighborhood groups recently, which has been great. Um, and typically, you know we would have we'd have online and in person events. Um, you know as a part of these types of meetings, but with COVID you know, that's, that's been very challenging and it's not just in Boise or in Idaho, that's nationally. And so what we've, what we've done is we've um, moved more online, um, but we've also had a broader reach in terms of who's been providing input uh, for State Street, which actually in a lot of ways provides, you know, more in-depth analysis. Um, partly it's, you know, we did that first survey, it's, it's you as residents and businesses along the corridor, but others within the city or even regionally experience State Street as drivers, whether it's commuters or to get goods and services. So these surveys were targeted both to local residents and businesses, but also more broadly the, the, the um, commuting, commuting community um, around State Street and how that's used. So we had some great response um, and I think some pretty in-depth uh, uh, kind of you know, focus on, on how State Street um, functions and what the priorities should be. So I'm just gonna step through that briefly. Um, as I said, we had two online sur surveys. We had about 565 responses on the first one uh, where we asked kind of generally, you know, what priorities were. And then the second survey, we had a slightly lighter response, but it was a much more focused survey response, survey type of survey where we actually asked people to budget money for different types of improvements. Where would you place priority? Um, both within the project type, but as well as through the corridor. 
Um, those surveys were map-based. Um, each survey, you actually had thousands of data points that came out of that. So when you look at the density of the information we provide, we've um, uh, were delivered, there's a lot of information that actually goes into the basis for, for these projects. Um, we had six neighborhood meetings, met, met with every neighborhood association along the corridor. Um, there were some questions about how we're working with ACHD and ITD. Um, we've met with them both individually as well as through some commissions that um, that kind of you know talk about State Street in general. We've talked to the school district and Valley Regional Transit, as well as Preservation Idaho and the State Historic Preservation Office. Um, there are some properties out there that are either listed or eligible properties along the corridor. We wanna make sure that we, we capture that within, within the framework plan. And then also, as Matt mentioned, and a question about um, Garden City, we have talked to city council and staff um, through that. So we are coordinating. Uh, they're not part of the, the urban renewal plan, but they are part of the broader conversation around State Street. So for survey one, um, again, we had you know just about 560 responses. Um, and these, this, these responses are really consistent from what we've been seeing in the chat here for this meeting is that you know, overall, we're you know, improving amenities for biking, walking, and transit. Um, about the same creating a safer and better connection to surrounding neighborhoods. So it's partly the corridor as people experience it, but it's also how you get in and out of neighborhoods along the corridor as well too. Um, lots of people felt that improving the streetscape, whether that's bike lanes, landscaping, you know, side, better sidewalks was very important as a part of this project. And then also, you know, thinking about this as an economic development tool, you know, how do we attract local businesses to this to this area. And so partly it's it's safety and other pieces, but then there's that other element of it of how do we attract those local businesses to both, you know, kind of locate, but also stay within the corridor. So really good, you know, input and very consistent with what we're hearing um, uh, through the chats today. So we went back to the community um, later in the, um, early in 2021, and we took what we heard from the first survey, um, and as well as some, uh, you know, some additional analysis to go into that. And we looked at kind of where, you know, those priority improvements should occur. You know, if we start to kind of think about from a corridor standpoint, where are those key hotspots? You know, where, where are things or areas that are, you know, most important to tackle now? Um, and then what types of improvements should happen within those spaces? Um, mobility overall was, was by far the, you know, the highest percentage of, of responses where people really felt that, you know, it, it's, it's, it's about, you know, making sure that it's safe and efficient for all users. And so I think you'll see within the frameworks, those, those pieces have come together, but not, you know, not to discount, but also economic development and housing, um, providing affordable housing options within the area, being able to provide mixed use options is the areas either redevelopment or re rehab, um, which we showed in that example for Collister, being able to provide that along the corridor to you know create those spaces that have both housing, but also have the services to support it. And then placemaking, which is kind of a planner term. Um, placemaking is art, um, plazas, public spaces um, to support people who live within the corridor. And so those are kind of what makes the area special, but also unique. So how do you, if you're increasing housing or other economic development activities, where are the spaces and places that make it kind of a great place to be? Um, so that's what placemaking is. So again, you know, very consistent with what we heard from the first survey, um, but also very much more specific in how we should prioritize funding for those. And sorry, Alex, I'm just gonna jump in um, really quickly. Um, Denise had a question regarding um, where does um, the C CCDC get money to fund a new urban renewal district? So I think that will help um, kind of establish or everybody understand a little bit more. I think maybe Matt would be the best person to answer that. Yeah, I'll take that. So uh, since there's no increment value at the beginning, where does CCDC get the money to fund a new urban renewal district? So yeah, at, at the beginning, um, we look at these, a 20 year district, we basically divide it into four or five year quarters. And in the first quarter, it's, it's strictly cash flow in terms of what we can pay for. Um, we don't have, generally don't have the capability to bond until about year six. So not a lot happens in the first quarter. The, the, the big quarter is that, that fourth quarter, years 16 through 20. Um, 
oftentimes what we'll do is is like a, a tax increment reimbursement. So if we if if some developer wants to come in and do a project and it needs a certain amount of public improvements, uh, we'll enter into an agreement with them to reimburse them some portion of that um, based on the tax increment that they generate. So that's a common way that we do it early on. But generally, there's just not there's not a lot of projects. Certainly, not a lot of big projects in that first five years. Great, thanks, Matt. Um, and then there was a question, and actually, Karen, this might be a question for you, um, and it's sign code. <laughs> so there was a question in the in the comments about uh, billboards and and kind of managing that. And I think maybe I'll start, then Karen, turn it over to you. Um, this plan does not regulate land use or pieces like that. It's more about the project pieces. Um, but Karen, from the city side, sign, sign code and land use, that is something that that the city manages, is that is that fair? That is that is correct, uh, with the exception of one billboard that's out there right now. Um, uh, it, it, actually, there's um, it, on the whole corridor, there are some that are still within the county as well, um, but the ones that are in the city limit, uh, the city does regulate the billboards and actually has a cap on the number of billboards throughout the city. Um, that it can't increase, but you can move them uh, the location from one place to another. Hope that helps. Great, thank you, Karen. And then just one other question, then we'll move, we'll move on um, to the next one. Um, Matt, there's a question about yeah you know, how these projects happen. You know, is this is this one lump sum contract or is it a number of contracts? And so, can you maybe talk about kind of how projects come to be? through urban renewal? Uh, sure, it's a number of ways. One, as I mentioned, we'll work with uh, um, individual developers for, you know, as their projects go in, um, determine eligible expenses. And, you know, depending on um, if the project, we feel it, 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 it merits the intent of the plan so that we're getting something other than, I, I don't think we're going to enter an agreement with like a big box store to put a big parking lot in front of it, um, you know, to pay for any of that, but something that kind of meets the, the intent of this, the, you know, transit-oriented development, um, reimburse them for, for some share of their expenses for public infrastructure, not for any of the private improvements of their building or any of that, um, but for the public infrastructure. Um, another is, um, say with the highway district, would be a cost share agreement because uh, the highway district is planning to widen State Street uh, and include sidewalks um, and now uh, multi-use pathways, but maybe they're putting in a, a 10 foot and we think a 12 foot is better. So um, paying them that difference for that to get that additional two feet, uh, as well as those landscape buffers in the street trees, they don't do those. So it would be a could be an interagency cost share. Um, and then lastly is projects that we take on ourselves. Um, and those are generally as the district gets more mature. And those could be things like um, public parks and plazas, West Side, um, the, the Cherie Buckner Webb Park that's going in now, it should wrap up this summer. Um, potentially doing canal pathways, uh, acquiring land to put out um, for requests for proposals for kind of mixed income, uh, affordable housing and mixed income development is another one. So those are kind of the different ways. There's certainly no one contract and it's, you know, it's, it, it, you know, toward the end of the district, it would be dozens of projects a year, dozens of different um, efforts. So hope that answers the question. I think so. I think, you know, just to summarize that it, it isn't one contract, you know, there's a variety of, of different types of projects that would happen over 20 years. Some would be partnerships with agencies and others would be, you know, kind of looking at how to um, achieve those vision pieces, which could be planned acquisition or, you know, other types of support. Yeah, I guess one other thing, Alex, I'd say is local match, um, because transit is obviously a big thing along this corridor. Uh, we could potentially provide uh, Valley Regional Transit with a local match, say if they get a federal aid grant. Um, that's what we did for Main Street Station downtown here, um, as well as uh, funding some site remediation. So, Great. Thank you, Matt. 
All right, so I'm gonna you see a question mark up on screen. So that means we're gonna launch a poll. Um, and I forgot to, to mention um, as we started off, if you are calling in, um, if you're not online, but you're calling in and you do have a question, um, click star nine on your phone and that will raise your hand um, there so we can see it and then we can bring your question, bring your question in. All right, so I'm gonna launch the poll real quick. All right, so we just stepped through some public engagement, uh, kind of those results and uh, um, you know, some of the chat. So do you agree or disagree with what the public has said about State Street? And the public meaning, meaning you either through the survey or through, through this meeting. Uh, let's see, somebody asked to see the public input slide again. I can show you that last one. Does that work? That's the priority improvements. And while everybody is still finishing up answering, um, Anne did have a question regarding um, what, what the end results will look like and if uh, or how closely it will be to what we have planned, if I'm understanding that question correctly. Um, if CCDC doesn't have authority to mandate a plan and proposals are subject to, um, for example, with Karen, the city, um, how close to the final product will uh, the original, or will what is being developed be? So, uh, and I guess I'd say, um... We've been working with uh, the authorities having jurisdiction for a number of years now, um, most recently on that State Street TOD implementation plan. So I'm fairly confident we're not proposing anything um, that's at odds with their plans or regulations, although the city will likely have to do some sort of zoning overlay for State Street. Um, the bigger thing is that the prerogatives, uh, or at least as big as prerogatives of, of developers and um, landowners, you know, obviously um, you need, you know, you need willing landowners and developers to want to do these projects. Um, we're just trying to kind of help them overcome some of those hurdles. Um, you know, mixed use can be very difficult to finance. Uh, so, yeah, I think what we're proposing is, has been in consultation with, you know, a lot of the transportation land use regulations and uh, trying to fit into those existing policies. So I don't know that we're making a lot of recommendations to them. We have a to-do list in terms of coordinating with ACHD and the city of Boise and, IT and ITD and everyone else, but certainly we're, you know, uh, this does depend on, on everyone's, you know, some consensus of moving forward. Great, thank you, Matt. All right, so there's just a, a couple questions. Um, did the public spe input specify between vehicle mobility and alternative mobility, i.e. walking, biking, and transit? Um, the survey we did ask about um, different types of mobility and you know, for the, the focus on this, you know, ACHD is already um, providing the vehicle mobility um, along the corridor, ACHD and ITD. You know, and so when we get into the projects here in just a moment, you'll see a focus on bicycle, pedestrian, and transit improvements to support that. And so there's, we did look at all of those elements um, with the funding here for specific to urban renewal. We're trying to capture the pieces that other agencies are not capturing, which is that bike, you know, biking, walking, transit, placemaking, economic development elements. Is that fair, Matt? Yeah. Um, so I did have one hand up um, from a call, call in. So um, I'm going to ask you to unmute and then I'm at, go ahead and ask your question or provide, provide that input. There we go, thank you. Uh, hi, yes, you had mentioned uh, planning and zoning and developing a possible overlay for the state street corridor. Is that in the works now as planning and zoning is undergoing its big multi-year rewrite of planning and zoning or is that something that you'd be working toward in the future? Karen, I think that's for you. You know, depending on the timing, um, it, it could go either way. I mean, I, ideally, if we can wrap it all in together, that'd be great. Uh, we'll just see once we get through this step where 
where the rewrite is in the process. Great, thank you. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and I wanna make sure we can get through some of these other pieces. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share the results uh, for for the polling and, and you know, overall, people either strongly or somewhat agree with you know, with the outcomes of State Street. There were a few that either um, strongly disagree or are not sure, but overall, you know, what we've seen from the past two surveys is generally consistent with what we're what you're telling us today in this meeting. All right, so let's let's move on to the next pieces. Get into the meat of things. So let's talk about the framework project. So these are the core elements that um, go into the draft framework plan. We talked in general about you know kind of what urban renewal is and the types of projects that it might fund. We've talked about you know how we got to this list of projects that we're going to talk about in just a moment. Um, but really, when it comes down to it, it's like what are the specific things we're going to look at by location? And so that's the key piece of this framework plan that we're just drafting now, and what we've where your input is important is how do we prioritize and focus those, those projects as they move forward. So the, the framework projects, um, they're based on community engagement and previous project lists. So there's been a number of comments about, are we coordinating with Ada County Highway District, Valley Regional Transit, ITD, and others? The answer is yes, we are. And we've looked at all of those lists to see which ones make the most sense to incorporate into the framework plan. Um, it does implement the State Street Transit Orient Development Implementation Plan, which is um, one of many kind of corridor plans throughout this area. And that's one reason why we're focusing on bicycle pedestrian transit connectivity as a part of that, because it looks at this area holistically. I um, mean, then, it, and as I said, it does consider or other corridor planning projects, um, such as the T-top and others that have been developed for this corridor. So these framework projects are certainly not the entire list of projects that are happening within the corridor. That would be a very large list. Um, we're really focused on how do we bring benefit um, from what the community has told us, but also support the other things that are happening within, within the corridor. So there are five specific project types. There's mobility, which are things like transit stations, State Street multi-use path, which would be on both sides of State Street, and that's a corridor-wide system. Um, some local streets, potentially parking structure or structures, depending on location. Um, there's infrastructure, which is kind of the bread and butter for a lot of urban renewal, like water, sewer, fiber optic. How do you actually support future development at the scale and, and type that, um, that the plans envision? Um, but then there's also placemaking, like festival streets, which are you know kind of specially designed streets that engage and create more kind of almost kind of park space within public rights of way. Um, but then plazas, parks, and green space as well. And then two others, economic developments. Uh, Matt touched briefly on land acquisition. If we are trying to provide more mixed use housing or, or other types of, of, of development within the corridor, actually be able to purchase property. And then special projects. Specifically for this area, it could be public art. Um, it could also be historic preservation for some of the sites that are along the corridor. So that's a big list. Um, but also a specific list of the types of things we're looking to do. So just some examples from mobility, you know, there's partly its connections to transit within State Street at some of those transit stations that we've looked at in previous plans, but also, you know, really, you know, enhancing bicycle and pedestrian connectivity along State Street. It's tough out there right now. And so, you know, these projects should be able to support and enhance pedestrian and bicycle safety. Um, we wanna make it safer for everybody to be able to be, use that corridor if you're not in a car. Infrastructure, you know, that could be, it could be new streets. It could be the infrastructure underneath, you know, the sewer and water, all of those pieces. How do you support um, that adjacent and future development to make it, you know, to make those uh, visions come to life? Placemaking which as I said, could be a festival street like the street on the left. It could be parks and public spaces. We know that more people are moving here. We also know that there is a need for parks and public space for existing residents and businesses, but also you know, things like wayfinding and others. Once you're on the corridor, how do you get to other places? So it's looking at those types of elements. Oh, going through. Sorry, my slide locked up on me. 
All right, sorry about that, slide locked up. And then economic development, you know, these are actually examples of projects that have happened within, within the city of Boise through urban renewal. And so whether that's land acquisition or supporting development in some way, um, you know, actually try to get a, achieve that development type and at all different scales. So it's not just, you know, five or six story building, it could be townhomes, walk-ups, apartments. It could be a number of different things as a part of that. And then finally, special projects, public art, historic preservation, but also rehabilitation of some spaces. You know, there are older buildings that we're seeing in the corridor that are being reused for other uses. Um, so kind of bringing those key elements in to not just kind of redevelop everything, but actually to rehabilitate and be able to reuse some of those historic or eligible structures. So lots of different types of projects, um, depending on where you're at. And then when we get into specific you know, kind of spaces, when we look at this six mile corridor, you know, we've broken it up by kind of major area, Horseshoe Bend, Bogart, Glenwood, Pierce Park, Collister, Veterans Park and Whitewater Boulevard. It's those kind of key areas along the corridor where, you know, potentially, you know, development could occur, but really where kind of those key transit nodes are going to be focused along the corridor. So how do you start to tie all these pieces together? And when you look at, you know, kind of project cost estimates by location, it's really spread out throughout the corridor, depending on the type of, of framework or framework project that we're developing that could be different between, for example, Glenwood versus Whitewater Park. Um, overall, there's money spent across the corridor, but different types of money for different types of projects, depending on location. So I'm just gonna step through briefly five maps that show in general, some of the, the projects that, um, that are proposed throughout this area. Um, we'll start down on the east side and look at the ITD site. So that's the, the big kind of vacant property, not vacant property, the, the, the wide property with, with ITD's headquarters at Whitewater Park Boulevard and State Street. And this was a node that was developed as a part of the TOD implementation plan where we actually looked at what future development might look like. And so a lot of these projects in this area are infrastructure to be able to support that future development of ITD, but also those linear improvements along State Street, like the multi-use path. So, you know, those are projects that would occur throughout these areas, but really kind of focusing on the ITD site and then some specific either streetscape or other connections um, in the area to make those, those connections to the street itself or to State Street itself. Collister, very similar. We spent a lot of time on the, tree, the TOD framework plan or implementation plan in Collister. Um, you know, looking at parks and plazas potentially, um, new transit station pairs, uh, you know, existing infrastructure is generally good for this area, but you know, things like median, some utilities through State Street to be able to support that future development. This one is really focused on reuse and how we, how we support that. Alex, and um, I think this is in reference to uh, the earlier concept plan that we saw, um, but there was a question um, on why the north and south sides appear to be developed differently. Oh, great. Thank you, Sue. Um, so one reason why we looked at that a little differently, and, and these are just concepts, development could happen in any number of different ways. This is just, you know, a vision. Um, on the north side of the street, there was more vacant land or parking areas. Uh, and so we, we redeveloped those areas under this vision um, to have more you know, space right up to the street with, with a, a small setback. The area on the south, we imagined as more of a rehabilitation of the existing business. So what if you took that existing building um, you know, it, it became available at some point in the future. We took that existing building and we made it into a maker space or smaller spaces for employment. And so that's why we kept that building and kind of changed its use, but kept the parking. Um, and then on the other side, it was just parking. So we, we used infill, you know, principles to kind of create that, that different side of the street. So it's just different ways to think about those, those areas. Doesn't mean that's how it's gonna happen in the future, but it was more like from an illustrative standpoint, what might make sense in that area. All right. Thank you, Sue, for the reminder on that one. Um, 
Pierce Park, this is this is an area we did not look at in the transit-oriented development implementation strategy. But again, you'll see improvements. That big T in the middle is the new transit station pair. Um, in this area, you know, again, mostly improvements along the corridor to improve bike and ped connectivity to transit, but some smaller pieces, some some park space, some in, some infill for streets and utilities, um, but really kind of focusing on that transit station at Pierce Park Lane. As we march west, um, Glenwood actually has two, has three stations, excuse me, two stations. Um, one at Glenwood, you know, looking at the mall area there, this is an area potentially with structured parking. If we, there was a question about if, you know, we're, we live too far away from transit, will we be able to park in those areas? And in some locations, potentially a parking structure. Um, and this was an area that has been identified for that. Actually, through a few previous plans as well. And then also another transit station out near the Walmart in that area. We try to space the stations so that they're not, um, you know, closer than about a third to one half of a mile. And so these are areas that um, actually could support two transit station pairs. And then finally Horseshoe Bend, which is the Western city limits of Boise. Um, this is an area that we did a lot of work on actually for the entire Inter intersection, but looking at it within the Boise side, how do we support future development in that area that could support transit? And so these are areas that are fairly low density development, larger parcels with not a lot of connectivity right now. And so projects in this area are really focusing on that local street connections, um, utilities, as well as park, as parking, or excuse me, as well as park space and other kind of public amenities that would be needed as a part of that, um, you know, future development. So those are the the frameworks in a in you know kind of a, a quick take. I'm looking. There's a couple comments coming in here. Sue, are you able to track these right now? We have a long comment coming in. Yeah. Um. Do, do you want to get into those right now? Um. Maybe I'll, I'll launch. I'll launch the poll, and then let's bring let's come back and talk to that. Okay. All right. So I'm going to launch a, a poll. We have one more after this. So this one is project priority. And so there are a number of projects on the maps we just talked about. And I know I went through them kind of quickly, but you know, in general, those those five elements that are on on this um, on this survey. And so which which types of projects do you think we should do first? So as uh, folks are finishing that question, um, there was a earlier uh, question about kind of the short-term improvements. Are there plans for short-term improvements? Uh, I so, think, oh, go ahead, Matt. Well, so like I said, there's, in the first five years of a district, there's, um, we have limited ability to do something unilaterally. So. Um, it's going to be working primarily with developers as well as um, if ACHD has any, any projects going in that we can potentially scrape the funds uh, together for cost share. So uh, the first five years, nothing immediate. It's after that that we start getting into it. And um, I guess I, I would, uh, I'll couple that with another question from Denise. Are those numbers based on what you think the increase in value will be? And I think that's expenditures by node, the pro, um, projected cost by node. Um, and that's in the, the feasibility study, the draft economic feasibility study for this, which is available on the website, ccdcstatestreet.com. Um, it, it's based on the estimated costs of the, of the projects um, that Alex just went through on the maps for the various nodes. Um, so it's about 110 million in present value costs. I think we're looking at about, we're, we're forecasting about 80 million in um, present value revenues. So there is a shortfall there of unfunded projects, which could be funded is, you know, if there's more funding available, uh, either the district performs better, or there's more federal uh, grant funding available, um, things like that. So uh, that's what it's based on is, is 
um, cost estimates that were done by a local engineer here um, for these various kinds of, of improvements. Um, and I, I would encourage you to go take a look at that economic feasibility study. It's got all the numbers and it's got all these projects broken down by the four quarters. If we expect it to go be one of those small projects done in, in years one through five or a bigger project done in, um, in years six through 15. It's got all of that in there. And again, it's, it's our best guess. So um, it's not written in stone, but I, I think we've got, um, we've got pretty good estimates uh, at where these projects would go based on what's there now, uh, what capital improvement plans are for ACHD, um, and yeah, what would likely develop or redevelop first. Yeah, and Jordan, at the end of the presentation, Jordan will post the website um, that we have a lot of this information on, and um, that's a good repository of you know the kind of past reports and, as Matt mentioned, the feasibility study. Um, so we'll get that out too by the end of the um, at the end of the presentation here, and we'll put it in the chat so you can copy it in and make sure you get there. Uh, there was a there's a couple of questions here, and I'll leave it on this slide. Um, the first question is, I think, concern about you know kind of losing some of those small local businesses within the area. Um, you know, certainly, a lot of there are a small a lot of small local businesses that people go to for everyday services, and you know, I think the maybe Matt, I'll, I'll turn sure. over to you on on that comment, but definitely a concern we're hearing on some of the con the chat. Um, yeah, I, th I think I've seen some various, uh, this concern expressed in various ways. Collister, I know there's, there's concern over the post office potentially closing there. Um, concern over businesses that don't, don't serve the neighborhoods. Um, and while, I, you know, I can't commit to preserve the Thriftway home store, the tire store, the dollar store or anything, um, we can tailor our, our participation program toward, you know, things like neighborhood serving businesses um, rather than things that, that don't serve the neighborhood. So um, it's a fair point. You know, there's nothing, there's nothing out there right now that would um, prevent, you know, whoever the landowner is from selling to some developer and, and having that displaced anyway. Uh, with a the district there, though, we can um, provide incentives to get kind of more of what we want to see, um, um, where the regulatory agencies kind of fall short. So, yeah, that, I guess that's all, all I can say about that. It's, you know, things do change and redevelop, but hopefully we can provide incentives to see what, you know, to get, achieve what the neighborhood wants to, wants to have happen along state. And a follow-up question to that, Matt. Um, Katie Decker had a question. Will tailoring to neighborhood serving businesses um, be written in the plan or is it the discretion of the CC board? So I think that's kind of how, we, how you know, kind of what the goals are from a project funding standpoint. If I'm understanding you correctly, you know, this is really, you know, the goal of this is to provide neighborhood serving businesses, you know, you know, specific infrastructure to support, you know, kind of what we've heard through the public engagement, as well as, you know, supporting those key opportunities for you know, future housing and mixed use development through the corridor. Is that, is that fair? Um, well, I guess to answer the question directly, that'd be written into our participation program. Um, it would not be part of the plan. So it would be something that's um, approved by our board subsequent to the plan adoption. All right, so let's see. All right, and just one other question. Um, what might the incentives be for, for that? Like, and I think, you know, if, there, if we are looking at locally serving businesses, you know, are there, are there incentives you could talk about? Uh, well, with our, our type two um, participation agreement, that's basically where we're uh, reimbursing them some amount of their costs for, for those public improvements and that public infrastructure. Uh, and there's a scorecard there. And based on how well they perform that scorecard for things like um, what kind of use it is, um, the, you know, the, the urban design, the, for, the urban form of it, um, if it includes things like affordable housing, you know, it's, it can be tiered to 40, 60, or 80% of their uh, public eligible expenses. So that's, that's an example of what that could look like. 
Um, I think that, that that's great. And then I'm going to put you on the spot one more time, Matt, and then we're going to move on. Um, uh, is there an opportunity for a public comment on the participation agreement prior to board approval? And so, Katie, if I'm understanding your question, it's not approval of the plan, which is a public process, but on that future, like how a how the CCDC would actually participate in a potential project. I believe that's what the, the comment is, Matt. Uh, I you know, there's always an opportunity to comment. Our current participation program is on our website. Um, I guess I would say if people are wondering, well, why isn't that just included in the plan? Um, the way urban renewal plans work in the state of Idaho are, are, are fairly um, strictly prescribed by the legislature. If something's in our plan um, and we need to change it, we need to do a plan amendment, that resets the base year and 20 years seems like a long time. In order to achieve what you're trying to do um, with tax increment, it's really not. I mean, it's a, it's a fairly short time frame. 30th Street is now halfway through its tenure. And I mean, we're just now getting started on it. So a, a change that would cause us to reset the base year would, I mean, it would basically, in my opinion, it would sink the district. Um, so you can't have something like the participation program, which we, you know, we, we make tweaks and adjustments to it every couple of years. Um, it just can't be part of the plan. It, it, the board needs to have the flexibility to adjust that as the market changes, as desire for things like, um, you know, we've really made a shift toward affordable and mixed income housing um, recently that, you know, we weren't doing so much five years ago. So uh, there's a need for flexibility and that's why that's not included uh, in the plan. But uh, certainly you're welcome to review it. And I imagine the program, uh, participation program, we would have one specifically for State Street because it's different than downtown. Um, and uh, the board's always open for public comment on those kind of things. Great. Thanks, Matt. And so um, yeah, the framework is a general kind of you know, direction over the next 20 years, kind of how, where we want to go and what we want to do. And as Matt mentioned, those participation programs are much more dynamic so that, you know, you can be able to you know, respond to market changes, market shifts, uh, any of the projects that, projects that come up over time. And that is a public process as a part of the commission. So that would be a way to provide that input. All right, we have about 15 minutes left. Um, so I'm going to end this poll. I think most people have, have um, responded. So the question was, you know, what are, with all the projects on the map, what should we do first? And, you know, mobility, transit stations, local streets, um, multi-use path, those by far were the, were the strongest or the highest um, number of, we received the highest number of votes. Um, but then the others, you know, kind of down in the middle there, infrastructure, place making and economic development, kind of receiving generally about the same. But overall, you know, this poll is showing, you know, specific mobility treatments are, are the most important pieces uh, to address most quickly within the corridor. All right. So I'm going to do one more. I'll go back to my... Since we're in the polling thing, got to put my question mark up there. Um, so let's go to the last piece. So that last one was project priority. We're gonna launch one last poll, which asks about location. So we step through you know, kind of all of these various station elements. And um, there was a question about veterans um, parkway and that's primarily station uh, station pairs with, uh, with some infrastructure. And so I'll put that map back up there so you can see generally where those areas are. Then it looks like Denise asked a question about uh, what I assume is the proposed interfaith sanctuary relocation mm -hmm. to um, the old Salvation Army site. Um, you know, we did not take that into consideration with the feasibility study. Uh, it, you know, it does take um, a parcel there near Collister, um, you know, out of consideration, but that wasn't a major piece in the feasibility study. And, 
Yeah, I, I, I understand and appreciate the neighborhood concerns about this. I got this a number of times at the neighborhood meetings. Um, it's not something we're involved with um, currently. I don't know that we'd be involved with it in the future. I mean, like I said, with the first five years, most of what we do is based on tax increment generation and it would be a tax exempt parcel. So I, I don't know how we could uh, help, you know, assist with that even if we wanted to. So um, hope that answers your question. Great, thanks, Matt. All right, so just about another 10 seconds on the priority locations. All right, I'm gonna shut it down. Share the results. Okay, interesting. So um, when we asked about these these specific areas, Collister um, definitely popped out as priority location to to consider. You know, for all of those various projects that we have within that, um, Glenwood's the Glenwood Station area as well too, which is you know actually two station areas next to Walmart and the and the the shopping mall out there. Um, but also Whitewater Park uh, received some some votes as well too. So, you know, I think Collister definitely the most votes followed by Glenwood, but then Whitewater Park's right in there with Glenwood Station area as well. So that's great input. Thank you for that. All right. So with that, um, so there's one other question, uh, Matt, since you were on that about the property tax exemption. Mm -hmm. Can you just talk about that? Then we'll talk about next steps. Then we have a few minutes just for open open questions. Uh, sure. It's so if a property has an exemption from property tax, are they unable to participate in the CCDC program? Um, yeah, amounts available are based on taxes paid. That's that's with a development. If we're doing a tax increment reimbursement, there needs to be some amount of tax increment with which to reimburse for those public improvements. So they couldn't do they couldn't participate in one of those. Um, but there are other ways. Um, some examples like City Hall, we, we helped uh, to pay for some of the plaza and the streetscapes around it when it was being renovated. Um, that was with a district that was fairly mature. Um, so we had funds other than just that direct tax increment reimbursement. So um, that is possible if a, if a property is ex exempt from property tax. There would have to be some public benefit to it though. So maybe it's, I don't know, maybe it's a city owned um, property that they want to do a park on and we help to improve that. That's a, that's a potential option. So um, I would say it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't exclude them from being able to participate with um, some form of urban renewal improvements. It's, it would just be um, dependent on the public benefit and the resources available, which probably will be extremely limited in the first five years. Great. Thanks, Matt. All right, so let's talk about next steps here real quick. And then, Matt, I'm gonna turn it back over to you for this, talk about where we're at. So yeah, uh, we have open house number three that you're currently at. Um, and following this, we'll have about a two week comment uh, session and you can make comments all the way through, um, but they're of most use in the next two weeks um, for us to take them into consideration and in finalizing these documents in July. Uh, so that's a draft plan narrative, uh, the feasibility study and these, these frameworks, which also have a, a narrative portion with them. Um, we'll have a work session um, with our board in July to, to give them a preliminary comment, uh, recap of these comments as well as the draft plans, and then we'll get them revised uh, for the board to consider at their August 9 meeting. Um, they'll consider the plan for adoption by resolution at that time. Should they give it a thumbs up, we will then transmit it to the city of Boise as well as the other six, I believe, taxing districts uh, the end of that month. Uh, planning and zoning has to make a finding of conformity. Uh, we would like for them to get that done at one of their September meetings. Um, it's a finding of conformity with the comp plan. Uh, then they would send that recommendation to the city council, uh, which would consider the urban renewal plan at a public hearing, um, preferably in October. Uh, and then following that, if they approve it, there would need to be the calendar readings. Uh, and then the plan would be transmitted again, the final plan ordinance to the taxing districts, uh, recorded at the county uh, and the ordinance published. And then it would be established uh, in the calendar year 2021. 
Great, thank you, Matt. And so just, um, you know, in terms of this, you know, this process, we have another open house this evening. So it's gonna be the exact same format and presentation as what we what we just stepped through. So we'll, we'll continue to take input from this meeting as well as the next one. Um, we will be putting the maps and um, the key elements of the draft plan. Um, we'll be getting that out so that you can comment on that. Um, that will be going up onto the website shortly. Um, we're working on, on developing that right now. And then uh, we'll also be posting um, the videos as well as uh, a way to comment on some of these things coming out too. So that's, that's a great way to, in addition to attending this meeting, which will be recorded and, and um, summarized, particularly the chats as well as the, the discussion, um, we'll be able to take that back and be able to make modifications and update prior to the next steps for this process. Um, and Jordan, thank you for posting that. So if you are looking for the website for any of the additional existing information, um, ccdcstatestreet.com uh, is, is the website. You can click on the, the chat. It'll take you right to the website right now, or you can just cut and paste and, and um, review it at your leisure. So we have, we have just a few minutes left. I want to appreciate everybody's time and thank you for this. Um, feel free to use the chat. If you want to speak in person, raise your hand and we can, we can get you um, onto screen, uh, but just, you know, whatever you're most comfortable with, uh, we'd be happy to stick around for a little bit longer to take additional input. All right, well, with, with that, um, this has been great. So I just, I just wanna thank everybody for spending their lunchtime with us. I know it's, it's kinda of tough to be on Zoom more. <laughs> so we do appreciate your time uh, for calling in or you know, um, clicking in whatever makes, uh, uh, whatever's easiest for you. I think the, um, the key output for this is we um, are definitely interested in what you have to say. And we wanna make sure that this plan, you know, relates and reflects what the needs are of the corridor, uh, specifically businesses and residents um, who use it, and live near it, um, especially. And so if you have any additional comments or questions, feel free to check out the website that, that again, Jordan put in, into the chat, but also Matt and Jordan um, are available too to take questions and comments um, with that. But um, stay in touch on this. We will be having more postings on, you know, kind of status and where we're going uh, throughout the coming months, but we are hoping to wrap this up by October and, you know, launching into the fall with, a, with an adopted plan. So thank you so much for your time. And with that, um, if there are no other Oh, there was one more comment here. Um, if we have a specific project in mind that falls within the urban renewal area, do we need to wait for it to be approved by city council or can we start some, with some planning now? And so maybe, when a, is, that a, is that a project already on the books? Maybe you could expand on that a little bit and feel free to-, it, to Yeah, do we have it on our list? Yeah, is it, is it on our list? This is from John. And John, you can just tell us too if you don't want to type it in. Possible expansion of existing facility on State Street. I guess it probably depends on what the facility is. <laughs> Housing. Matt, do you um, want to take that real quick? Uh, yeah, so we've, we do have funds programmed. Um, they're, they're a few years out should this get adopted to, um, you know, acquire land and put it out for, you know, some mixed use, mixed income housing. So, uh, yeah, I don't know how planning that would go. Um, I think everyone's very interested in getting more housing built. So. Well, it sounds like Matt, maybe we have our, our first project if it's adopted <laughs> and the timing and the timing. All right, well, well with that, I wanna, th I wanna thank everybody from their time. Um, stay cool, uh, the heat is gonna get worse for a little bit. Uh, drink a lot of water and, um, and yeah, thank you so much for the time and stay in touch. Thank you. All right.